War comes suddenly, and it comes from the sky. A loud blast, and everything that was once the comfort of home, now gone. For the elderly, limited in movement, many can't make it down to the underground shelter of this nine-story building. Rescue workers pick up parts of what used to be ordinary lives in Kyiv. It's hard to comprehend what is happening here. A few hours later, another strike in the capital. This war is now into its third week. And this is the view from the other side, in Russian-backed, separatist-controlled Donetsk city in the east. A large Ukrainian bomb landed here on Monday, and there have been casualties here too. Military analysts may be assessing that Russia's advance is slow, but it is deadly. Humanitarian corridors have been agreed upon for Monday, and more aid convoys are planned. We will again try to unblock the movement of the humanitarian convoy from Berdyansk to Mariupol. The port city of Mariupol remains under a devastating siege. Attempts to move civilians out has failed day after day. People may remember this heavily pregnant mother being rescued following a Russian strike on a maternity hospital last week. News now emerging that she and her baby have died. On the day when the maternity hospital was hit, three women were brought here. One was in critical condition with a crushed pelvis and a detached hip. While we were resuscitating her and carried out a cesarean section and took out her lifeless child, more than 30 minutes of resuscitation didn't produce any results. Then, more than 30 minutes of resuscitation of the mother didn't produce results. Both died. But new life is also bringing joy here, despite being born into an uncertain future. These are terrifying days. But there is defiance here and the uncompromising will to survive. The war is never far away. The mental toll unbearable in a city under bombardment. Nowhere feels safe. Talks between both sides are expected on Monday. Russia says Ukraine needs to compromise for the war to end. But for now, the army, the president, and countless civilians across the country who have taken up arms to defend their nation and their future refuse to do so. Stephanie Decker, Al Jazeera. Imran Khan has more from outside the residential building shelled in Kyiv. It was just after five in the morning when an artillery shell hit the entrance of that building. We think it's an artillery shell. Now, that's the entrance of a residential building here in the north of Kyiv. And just take a look at the damage. You can still actually smell the burning. Now, rescue efforts are still continuing. You can see uh, the fire engine there with the ladder going up. Uh, they're still coming through the building to see if there are any more bodies inside. We are hearing that at least one person has been killed. There have been a number of injuries as well. This is a residential building, uh, and that was the entrance to that building, making, like, making the ability for people to get out. In almost impossible. I mean, just take a look. It's an incredible amount of damage all the way through, and on the other side of this building as well. Now, shelling has taken place uh, in areas near here, in Irpin and in Bucha, but this is inside Kyiv. This is north Kyiv. Well, joining us from Kyiv is its mayor, Vitaly Klitschko. Thank you very much indeed, sir, for being with us. We've just been showing pictures of some of the damage from the attacks in Kyiv this morning. I understand that you've been to at least two of the sites of the attacks. How do you feel when you see what the damage has been done? <clears throat> How I feel? I feel so bad uh, as feel uh, every Ukrainian citizens because it's nobody feel him safety right now in Ukraine. First point. Second point. The Russian propaganda uh, zoned all Russians and explain this war. They target just uh, military forces. And uh, they explain about uh, freedom and some mission what have Russian soldiers uh, uh, to bring the peace to working against nationalists, fascists, radicals. It's everything, it's everything is a liar. Uh, 
today we have a pictures if civil building with where live peaceful people was destroyed people died many injured two two racket attack to kiev is not just first one we have a lot of uh, experience in the past couple of weeks what do it what did uh, russian aggressors uh, and uh, yes of course they target to bring the, the the goal to bring the panic to the city after these pictures we more and more sure we never give up we will be fight uh, russians killed our children destroyed our building destroyed our city we're ready to fight ready to fight and defend our city no never ever Russians to come to our city. I promised that as mayor of Kiev, and I told the people, the citizens, told everyone exactly the same. Right now, many people, all, all uh, the population, uh, everyone, every citizens of Kiev, who never have idea to take the weapons in the hand, right now, with peaceful profession as doctors, actors, musicer, musician, and uh, any profession take the weapons and uh, ready to defend our future. We never go to the knee. We defend our children. We defend our houses. We defend our city. We defend our future. We've been reporting a lot on the foreign weapons that have been uh, apparently moving into Ukraine. Do you believe that the people of Kyiv are able to defend their city? Uh, we very appreciate for our partners, for countries who support Ukraine, because we defend not just Ukraine. We defend right now the principles. We defend right now the same values. And it's very important to help Ukraine. We very appreciate for humanitarian help for medical, uh, delivering the medical uh, uh, staff, medical uh, care to uh, medication to, to our hometown. We very appreciate to, uh, for, uh, to become defensive weapon, defensive, because we defend our country. And uh, it's very important right now to support Ukraine, because this war, can touch anyone, not just in Europe, around the world, because this war against normal human principles. We have seen mayors of other cities in Ukraine being replaced. Um, how worried are you about your own safety? Right now, every Ukraine, Ukrainian feel unsafety with the war. Is everyone have a risk to die. But uh, the aggressors want to bring panic to our city. With this attack to civilian buildings, uh, the pictures what we see when kill our children and our women, they give to us the power. We're ready to fight. We never ever give up and we never give uh, our city. Kyiv was Ukrainian city, it was Ukrainian capital, and will be in the future always Ukrainian, because we are ready to fight and defend our city. I By the way, thank, thank you very much for, for the help. It's very important for us. Uh, there, we've reported on the number of civilians who have already been evacuated from cities like Kyiv. Can you give us some idea of your plans to evacuate remaining civilians should the city be attacked directly by Russia? Already, thousands, hundred thousand of uh, the citizens already moved. <clears throat> Almost is children and women. Men back to uh, come back to Kyiv and ready to defend the city. 
Finally, sir, we understand, of course, that NATO and its allies are refusing to enforce a no-fly zone over cities like Kyiv and other parts of Ukraine. Can the people of Kyiv and Ukrainians defend their country if they do not have a no-fly zone? If NATO can do a, a can't close air and uh, no fly zone status give to Ukraine, please give to us the modern weapons, give to us the stingers, and we by self close the air above our heads. Vitaly Klitschko, mayor of Kyiv, we appreciate your time, sir. Thank you very much indeed for being with us on Al Jazeera. Thank you. We've got correspondents in Ukraine across developments. Shortly, we'll cross the Asad Beg in Dnipro with more on the humanitarian corridors, as Stephanie mentioned in her report. First, we're going to bring in Jonah Hall in Libby for an update on the talks that have been going on. Is there any further news out of the, uh, the negotiations that have been happening? Uh, we're not getting any sort of running commentary or updates out of those talks. They are ongoing. They're happening in the in a video conferencing format this time, the fourth time that these two negotiating sides have met at the level of sort of minister, deputy minister and parliamentarians. Uh, of course, not the foreign ministers as met in Antalya, Turkey last uh, week and certainly not the president. So, you know, these are not ultimate decision makers. We are talking probably about discussions over humanitarian corridors, perhaps safe zones, uh, the deliveries of humanitarian aid uh, and so on, certainly not uh, final status uh, measures. And remember that up to now there's been very little in the way of breakthroughs and even the agreements that have been reached over humanitarian corridors have not held. But there have been some cautious signs of optimism in comments being made by both sides. Mikhail Podolyak, uh, an advisor to President Zelensky, saying the talks uh, are beginning to go more constructively, Russia perhaps being less ultimatum driven in its approach. He believes there may be results in a few days. Uh, and one of the uh, Russian negotiators, Leonid Slutsky, telling Russian media significant progress has been made in recent days. They're now having daily contacts, by the way, on some level. Uh, possible draft agreements could be reached very soon. Again, not final peace agreements probably more on the humanitarian level. In terms of the bigger picture, when does that begin to change? Well, look briefly at the battlefield now. Uh, Western intelligence agrees with the general staff of the Ukrainian military that very little uh, progress is being made by Russia on the ground. Uh, these battles around Kiev, yes, absolutely huge damage being caused, massive civilian uh, toll being caused. It is uh, forcing, uh, showing force reach in terms of long-range missile fire all the way to the west of the country, but little verifiable gains. Kiev still stands. Kharkiv in the east still stands. Mariupol improbably in the south still stands. So Russia doesn't have a solid corridor, land corridor, that it needs between Crimea and the east. No verifiable moves towards Odessa, for instance, until these concrete gains uh, materialize on the battlefield, it's very hard to see uh, Russia, Vladimir Putin, meeting Mr. Zelensky, as Mr. Zelensky wants, and actually talking peace. Jonah Hall in Lviv. Jonah, thank you very much indeed. OK, for more on Ukraine's plans to evacuate people to safety, let's speak to Al Jazeera's Asad Beg, who's in Dnipro in eastern Ukraine. Jonah was just telling us there that part of the negotiations will be the establishing of more humanitarian corridors. What do we know about the situation so far? Well, Ukraine has announced the establishment of 10 humanitarian corridors. Now, they're talking about the Kyiv region, uh, where they want to uh, get people out that want to leave, evacuate people, and also get uh, humanitarian aid in. Uh, some of those areas are controlled uh, by Russian forces, but also uh, in eastern Ukraine, where uh, areas are controlled by separatist and Russian forces, but there's still pockets of Ukrainian control in there and <coughs> Ukrainian resistance, uh, but trying to get medical and food aid in there, but also evacuate those that want to leave. But also, they're really concerned about Mariupol to the south uh, of the country, that important port city that has been besieged, uh, and there have been several attempts to try and create a humanitarian corridor to try to get aid in. Now, in theory, talking about humani humanitarian corridors, 
works, but in reality on the ground, at least in Mariupol, it hasn't. For the last week and a half, there's been several attempts to try and get aid in. There was 10 food trucks, there were 20 buses put on to try to evacuate people, and they were turned around, and there was allegations against the Russians saying that they had targeted those. Now, the Russians say that they don't target uh, civilians. We understand yesterday an uh, aid convoy got within two hours of Mariupol, uh, but was turned around, and today there's another attempt underway to try and get aid in. Now, from the authorities in Mariupol, we've heard today that uh, they've said 160 private vehicles have left uh, carrying around around one o'clock local time, sorry, uh, for the uh, city of Berdyansk, which is controlled by the Russians. Also, local authorities there say that the death toll now is 2,500 residents. That's over, uh, that's increased by over 300 since yesterday. But also from the International Committee of the Red Cross, now they say that the situation in Mariupol is dire, that people are uh, traumatized, that they are terrified, and there's nowhere for them to go. There's food and water shortages, and people are risking their lives to go out and try and get some food. And they're sheltering in unheated basements, and the temperatures are well below zero. So there is a considerable concern uh, around the humanitarian situation in Mariupol and uh, we'll find out whether uh, the country or both sides can establish humanitarian corridors to get aid to Mariupol. Uh, when Jonah was talking to us about uh, in his roundup of the, the, the fighting that was going on in Ukraine, he said that Russia still hasn't got a solid corridor, as he called it, uh, from the east. Talk to us about the fighting that's going on in Donetsk in the eastern part of Ukraine. So yes, we've heard that uh, in Donetsk there was a missile strike where they're blaming on the Ukrainian forces that killed 20 people and injured uh, eight. We can't verify that we can't, because we don't have access to those areas that are controlled by Russian troops and separatists. But even to the north of Yen Kharkiv, which is the second largest city in Ukraine, uh, the Russians still haven't been able to take that. They've hit that with uh, shells, with airstrikes and missiles, and they tried entering the city, but the Ukrainians did uh, uh, push the them back, they held out, and it still isn't under um, Russian control. But there are places around the east where the Russians seem to be making small progress, but it's not, it's very slow, it's not major because the Ukrainians are managing to resist. But we've also heard uh, that a shell has hit the city of Kromatosk and killed a residential building and killed two people. So they are still, uh, there's still fighting taking place. Uh, but again, as you said, uh, the Russians don't seem to have had many any major gains. Asa Beg talking to us from Dnipro. Asa, thank you very much indeed. Well, the Kremlin insists it's got enough resources for what it calls its military campaign in Ukraine. Russia also says it's been carefully planned to avoid civilian casualties, but that the US and the EU are trying to provoke it into attacking major population centers. Well, Dorsa Jabari is joining us now from Moscow. There have been a series of comments that have been coming out from the Kremlin. Um, what have they been saying? Well, the Kremlin spokesperson, Dmitry Peskov, uh, during his daily briefing, uh, said that according to the Russian Defense Ministry, they were instructed at the beginning of the so-called special military operation in Ukraine not to um, go into the large, heavily populated uh, cities. And that is at the request, of course, of the Russian president, Vladimir Putin. And he said that this kind of rhetoric and these accusations coming from Western leaders uh, is provocative because they are trying to uh, force Russia into uh, larger cities where there will be certainly uh, civilian casualties and to blame Russia for those casualties. And that is something that, of course, he says the Russian president has asked the defense ministry to avoid at all costs. It was also noteworthy that he said that uh, for the first time we're hearing this of what is the possible plan for these Russian forces in Ukraine. According to Dmitry Peskov, he said that the Russian military does not rule out the possibility of taking under full control of large populated areas in Ukraine to ensure maximum safety for the civilian population, hinting at possibly uh, the Russian troops are going to be staying in certain areas of Ukraine once they have captured uh, certain cities uh, and carried out what they're calling their special military operation. The uh, spokesperson for the Kremlin also said that their operation is going according to plan and they will finish it 
allotted in the amount of time that it's been allotted. He didn't specify how long it is still left of that. And he also said to the rumors that Russia has asked China for military aid, he said that is absolutely not true, that Russia is fully capable of carrying out this operation with all the military hardware that they have already. And in the meantime, there is, of course, more diplomacy. This time, the foreign ministers of Qatar and Russia have been talk in talks as well. Yes, the Qatari foreign minister arrived in Moscow on Sunday. Uh, Mohammed bin Abdul Rahman Al Thani met with the Russian foreign minister Sergey Lavrov for about an hour and a half uh, earlier on Monday, and then they made a brief statement following their meeting. Uh, clearly, they had a lot to discuss. Of course, the Qatari foreign minister said that Qatar was very much um, looking for uh, any possibility to assist in getting some kind of very peaceful resolution to the crisis in Ukraine and that the uh, Qataris will not spare any expense to bring about peace on that front. And he also said that they were very concerned about the escalation in violence and that uh, he was very much looking forward to trying to provide as much assistance to the Russians as possible. Uh, and the Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov also seemingly very happy to see his Qatari counterpart here in Moscow. He said that they appreciate the help and assistance and support support of the Qatari officials and that their cooperation will continue. They also discuss the uh, future of that nuclear deal that has been stalled in Vienna as a result of a certain number of demands made by Russians about the sanctions that they're now under by the U.S. government. Of course, all of this will be further discussed at later uh, discussions because the two foreign ministers said that the dialogue between the two countries will continue. Dorsa, Dorsa Jabari in Moscow. Dorsa, thank you very much indeed. Well, the U.S. and China have held high-level talks in Rome. The White House sees the meeting as critically important for the war in Ukraine. This after the U.S. accused Russia of seeking military aid from China. Well, Adam Rainey is joining us live from Rome. What's at stake for China, Adam, coming out of these talks? Well, to put it blatantly, business as usual, what is at stake, according to the National Security Advisor to the United States, Jake Sullivan, is business, trade, major uh, important issues for China. The EU is China's largest trading partner. China is the largest supplier of goods to the United States. And what Jake Sullivan has been saying in the last 48 hours is that a lot of that trade is at risk if China delivers any material or military or financial support to Russia during this war. Now, this is a very sensitive issue to China because it's trying to thread an increasingly small needle here. It's been saying that it, it uh, supports uh, Ukraine's sovereignty, independence. But going into this war, when uh, Xi Jinping met Vladimir Putin in China, he said that they had a rock solid uh, partnership, that there was nothing that could put it at risk. Now, a few weeks into this war, that doesn't necessarily still seem to be the case because China is having to weigh some decisions it perhaps did not want to make, and the U.S. is clearly trying to make those decisions tougher for China. If any sanctions were to be put in place that could put at risk billions of dollars of trade in the next weeks and months, this is also coming at a time that China is facing its largest outbreak of COVID since the early days of the pandemic. Many factories are being closed down or reduced in some of the industrial heartland of China. So that's that's the main thing at stake, business. But what what is going to be tricky for China is it's trying to say that, of course, this is not taking place, that Russia hasn't asked them for any help. They've been characterizing this as fake news without outrightly rejecting these claims. So I think the next 24 hours, we might see statements from both sides coming out of these meetings. It's been very tight-lipped here in Rome. But the fact that these talks are taking place in Italy is another important factor to take into consideration. Italy is one of the main uh, countries in the European Union, although it has large ties with Russia. It has given its full support to these incredible, unprecedented sanctions that have been put in place against Russia since the beginning of this war. And China is not blind to that fact. They know this is a different world than it was a few weeks ago before the war, and they're going to be weighing all of these these threats basically coming from the United States that, although it's just right now the National Security Advisor of the U.S. who's been holding these talks, that the fact that they're taking place in Europe implies that Europe might also be willing to put in place some, uh, some punitive measures that might make doing business with China a little trickier for them to come.
That's Adam Rainey talking to us from Rome. Adam, thank you very much indeed. Well, Lawrence Cobb is a former Assistant Secretary of Defence and also a senior fellow at the Centre for American Progress. He's joining us live from Washington, D.C. Good to have you with us, sir, on Al Jazeera. What kind of pressure and arguments do you think that Jake Sullivan is going to be using in these meetings with China? Well, I think he can say that if they should provide military assistance uh, to Russia, uh, basically that uh, they're going to be sanctioned just like Russia has and cut off trade with the European Union as well as with the uh, United States. And the European Union is China's largest trading partner. A lot of the things that China needs for its economic well-being they get from the, from the United States. So I think Jake is going to try and tell the China, you have two choices. You can be the peacemaker or you can create havoc for your country. It is a slightly difficult situation. One would imagine the U.S. finds itself, and to ask China not to support its ally, Russia, either economically or militarily, when, of course, the U.S. and NATO and its NATO allies are doing precisely that uh, for Ukraine. It's, it's a fine line, isn't it? Well, there's no doubt about it. Now, at the meeting that they had between the heads of China and Russia during the Olympics, basically China said they agreed with Russia that Ukraine should not become part of NATO. They did not sanction uh, the, the, the invasion. And it was very interesting when the UN came up with a resolution condemning uh, Russia. China didn't vote no. They abstained, which I think was a signal they're trying to have it both ways. They don't want to antagonize Russia because they see that as a counterweight to the United States. But on the other hand, they did not want to support it because the international order that they depend upon for their economic well-being is uh, in jeopardy when one country can just invade another country for no, no apparent reason. I want to ask you about this line that the U.S. Uh, was putting out, that it accused Russia of seeking military aid from China. Given your experience, sir, um, in defense matters, is that a surprise to you that Russia would need to do something like that? Well, I think what happened is President Putin underestimated how difficult and prolonged this war was going to be. So he was not prepared. He thought by massing 175 or 200,000 troops, Ukraine would cave and he'd march in like he did in 2014. But he's uh, found out that he's had to expend an awful lot of uh, ammunition and supplies like that that he may not have uh, stockpiled ahead of this. And so it's not surprising that Russia needs it. But again, who else would they get it from? China is the only uh, country that would have that type of uh, ammunition and the only one that has uh, supported uh, Russia. Now, I believe you met Vladimir Putin back in 1990. Given your impression of him then, the way, what, was there anything in his personality and anything that you saw that gave you any indication that may, he might be where he is now with this invasion of Ukraine? No, I mean, he was a, you know, at that time, he was a, uh, you know, KGB officer who was, you know, leaving the KGB as the Cold War ended. And he was the deputy mayor of, of uh, Leningrad. So he was a very, very orderly person and, and a very good administrator. And he was put in to take Russia over when Yeltsin had created chaos. They wanted somebody to kind of restore order and get Russia back uh, in improving its economic development. Nobody envisioned him coming in and trying to restore the glory days of, uh, of, the, of the Soviet uh, uh, empire. And we saw this real early, the, what he did in Chechnya. Uh, when the, in the beginning, Russia had not done well fighting Chechnya. He came in and just was brutal what he did. And that gave an indication of who he really was, which we had never known before because he was a relatively minor KGB uh, uh, officer. As always, we appreciate your expertise in this. Lawrence Cobb, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Thank you for having me.